Okay, perfect. So we're going to begin. So thank you for coming to today's session. Um, this is Dr. Sastri Vedam, and he's going to be talking about TPS commissioning. So everyone can leave their comments and questions in the chat. My name is Sastri Vedam. I'm a physicist at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And specifically, I've been working in the GYN BRACI program for the last five years here. And this is going to be a presentation focusing on TPS commissioning, treatment planning system commissioning, as part of this training, HDR training program. At any point of time during this presentation, if you have any question, please do not hesitate to stop me and you know ask your question. I'll try to clarify as, as much as I can to the best of my ability. And again, this is a presentation that is meant to start a dialogue between ourselves. It is not the final version, so to say. And my contact information is available with Adam, Claire, Betty, and the others. So if you feel you need to reach me at any point of time after this presentation is over, please don't hesitate um, to do so. That being said, uh, let's get started. I do want to acknowledge all the following people here, Adam Shulman, Claire Dempsey, Benjamin Lee, and Betty Chang for getting this whole project started and helping me also get familiar with the project and uh, setting things up and making this process easier for, for me as well. I'm sorry, I don't have all the affiliations uh, quite set yet, but I will get there uh, soon. I also have to acknowledge my colleagues and lawyer who was my supervisor. She just retired last week. And so she leaves a, a whole legacy of GYN uh, HDR you know, efforts here with me and also Firas Muttada, who, who is the chief of clinical physics currently in Delaware, who was uh, formerly a faculty member here. Him and Ann Lawyer were instrumental in getting the HDR effort committee here. And also Dr. Jingren, of course, who has been instrumental in getting us on board with this program here. So this is going to be a presentation in two parts. The first part uh, will focus on some non-dosimetric testing and dose calculation related tests. This is essentially not doing the actual dose calculation, but essentially reviewing the dose calculation in the interface that is provided by the treatment planning system software. And then in part two, we will actually focus on the dosimetric tests and the dose comparisons with Plato, which is an independent uh, TPS verification system for us, and some hand calculations as well. So for our system here, we have the Oncentras based setup with the Nucleotron, and we have Plato here as an independent calculation verification system. We also have our own hand calculation verification system here as well, and we will talk about all of that as we go through. So let's focus on part one. Now, this presentation is essentially going to outline various steps that we undertake here. Now, this is all keeping in mind, you know, the, the equipment that we currently have at our disposal and the amount of physics support that we have here. Now, I do understand that these parameters can vary quite a bit depending upon where you are and how many resources that you have access to. So we can definitely stop at any point and discuss alternative options or you know, prioritizing some of the testing over the others in case there are time, time constraints, things like that. <clears throat> so the first thing we want to test is you know, getting an image into the treatment planning system. So essentially what you would do is create a new patient or import a test patient transfer the CT image because CT is still the primary mode of uh, visualization for treating cancer. So transfer the CT to the treatment planning system. And essentially you would check the number of pixels in the image, the pixel size, the slice thickness. And then these all will be set based on what sort of you know, resources that are available at each particular institution. And once the images are in there, the first things you want to look at are 
geometric location. So is the patient's orientation being represented correctly on these 3D images? For example, is, it, is the left-right orientation displayed correctly? Is the head-foot orientation displayed correctly? And then the text information is, do the images transfer over correctly as well? So we have to make sure that you know, when we send the images from the CT simulator to the actual treatment planning system, all the images make it over correctly and that there is no corruption of the data as such. And of course, since all of our treatment planning and dose calculation is essentially based on the relative electron density information that is uh, available in these CT images, we have to ensure that whatever grayscale values are displayed in the image are in fact accurate. And so we want to go over and verify that the correct HU is displayed for a set of known densities. There are different ways in which we can do this, and then we, we, we can go through uh, you know, each individual example. <clears throat> and so when we do this, we want to have different structures with different densities, right? Please do remember that when we, when we develop phantoms, be they mathematical phantoms, um, or actual physical phantoms, there are certain differences. So if you're using an actual mathematical CT to represent densities of different structures, one has to keep in mind that that particular phantom may be too much of a perfect version of exactly what happens in real life because you're able to actually assign specific densities to structure without taking, to, taking into account the effect of scatter or attenuation of the relative surroundings. Whereas in a physical phantom, when you're actually doing a CT scan on it, depending upon where these heterogeneous densities are present, the effect of attenuation and scatter can contribute to some variations in the local densities that one might see. So as long as we are cognizant of this fact, uh, we can uh, commission our treatment planning systems accordingly. And then, of course, we want to test the expansion and contraction structures. So, and we can easily do this by drawing some sample contours, both regular and irregular, expand or contract them by a known amount, and verify that the algorithm is able to actually compute the correct volumes and also represent these contractions or expansions correctly. If uh, we want to go one step further, we can also verify that this algorithm works for complex shapes uh, or surfaces, not just a cylinder or a sphere, but you know, uh, structures with sharp points, square corners, concavities, because these are the kind of structures that we can encounter during um, GYN brachytherapy especially. And of course, once all of this is done, the other thing to test is, whether this expansion or contraction is automatically updated if the source structure is changed. So for example, if one physician were to come in and contour, say for example, the rectum, and then another physician comes in and say, well, no, I think uh, we need to make some changes here. And he or she goes on and makes those changes. Do these expansions automatically get recomputed and displayed or do we have to go back in and uh, manually generate them again? Either way, one has to go back and test uh, whether the treatment planning system is doing a correct job. So I do have a question here that says, why is uh, checking Hounsfield unit important, important? And that Hounsfield unit has no impact on dose calculation. Well, if we're considering that everything is homogeneous, you know, and just doing like a straight shot TG43 based calculation, yes, we ask, we can assume everything to be water. But some of the modern treatment planning systems here, though, have the ability to account for changes in the local densities or heterogeneities. And these days, when we're doing HDRs or tandem and ovoids, uh, we are talking high dose per fractions. So if you want a more accurate estimate of the dose based on some sort of model-based dose calculation algorithm, then in that case, yeah, the HU does end up becoming a little bit more important. The other thing to remember also is that the implants themselves, they are not made of any natural, you know, natural materials in the sense they're not bone 
or soft tissue or you know things of that consistency or density they can be high high density structures some of the treatment planning systems have the ability to model radiation transport through the applicator as well so in those instances it is important for us to be able to take into account the effect of Hounsfield units hopefully that answers the question there so moving on so that's as far as the actual image set itself bringing the image to, uh, you know set in and as i mentioned before we can either use a mathematical phantom or a ct image set once we do have that image set in we actually go back in and contour on those images so typically we contour on 2d images you know depending upon how big or small the volume is we may choose to use some sort of interpolation automatic interpolation procedure because you don't want to spend an hour contouring a big structure on each slice and also depending upon the slice thickness you know, for example we're acquiring one millimeter slices we can spend a whole day just contouring some structure right so we want to try and see first of all whether the contour is displayed at the correct location and if a distinct contour is in fact created and closed and the identification of the contour and its associated 3d structure so as you create these contours you want to go back and verify the 3d implementation of the structure across the ct image and then we run all these tests so if the treatment planning system allows now some treatment planning systems may allow us to contour on a slice that is not transverse so you can you can do this in um, the sagittal plane or even the coronal plane we want to be able to see that when we do these contours on any plane other than the transverse plane that the end result still is consistent with what would happen if we were to, for example contour on the transfer uh, transverse plane uh, or the axial plane now the ground truth is of course if you are actually using uh, this planning system to contour uh, regular objects let's say uh, we can always compute the volumes from those contours and then compare that to the actual volume that we know that structure to have okay so that's essentially verifying whether that contouring tool is actually working correctly and then the next thing to do is well, how does the system handle image artifacts or high z materials as we all know anytime you place a gyn applicator those those applicators are metals and metals do not do very well in a ct environment typically because they create streaks and they create shadows both of which are not very very good for uh, treatment planning per se now again if one were to just assume that everything surrounding the applicator was water, most of this would not matter, but at least from a dose calculation standpoint. But if one were to actually try and draw tumor volumes, target volumes, for example, in areas that are close enough to the applicator, some of these streaks and shadows will affect what we tend to identify as a target especially when we are close to the applicator so that's why we need to understand how the treatment planning system is able to handle these image artifacts or high z materials and then of course there are some complex structures for example like these bifurcated structures as an example not necessarily in the in the pelvis uh, but say in the lung, if you have like the bronchi, the bronchioles, which are bifurcating from a common standpoint, are we able to maintain more than one contour per slice for a given structure? And that's an important ability to have, especially, for example, down in the pelvis, if you're trying to contour like veins, arteries, whatnot, where there is every chance for these structures to bifurcate. And then does it form that 3D structure correctly based on what we contour? So we do have to go back and verify these 3D structures visually and also check the DVH once we have that report from the plan to, to, to correctly understand that whatever the deep treatment planning system is putting out does in fact make some sense. Right. 
And once all of this is done, the contour projections, you know, the, how do these contours display on the projection images or DRRs? Uh, so we check that the points that are defined on the projection image define lines through the 3D data, right? So if we pick a point on a projection image, and when you see that in 3D, it should be able to define a line. And we also have to go back and look and verify that the contours drawn on projection images are projected correctly when viewed in full 3D. And any intersections of these contours with axial, sagittal, or coronal slices are actually maintained. Okay, So these are all very important in terms of spatial alignment of the contours with respect to the plane of imaging. Now, in a lot of instances, in some instances, at least here at our institution, we, you know, based on the type of applicator that we have inside the patient, we tend to acquire CT slices with a gantry tilt, right? So we are not actually acquiring true axial images, but we are acquiring images with a tilt so that the angle of that tilt is essentially parallel to the plane of the shields, for example, in the ovoids. So in, in cases where we're using these adjustable shields for some of the ovoids, it's important that when we move them out and in, and these shields are typically used to reduce the dose to the rectum and the uh, bladder uh, in some instances. So we want to make sure that the angle that the CT image makes with the shields itself is not contributing to additional artifacts. So that's something that we also need to verify if, if we are doing procedures like that. And then extracting these contours from surfaces. So essentially can contours be cut to a slice of arbitrary orientation? This is, a, this is again going back to what I was mentioning before. Are there enough points available to accurately define the contour? Again, this is a, a matter that's left to the user to actually accurately define the contour. Now, we can spend a whole uh, you know, bunch of hours trying to get the exact contour correctly by placing infinite number of points on the edge of the contour. But the question to be asked is, how good is the algorithm, or rather how reasonable is the algorithm in estimating a fairly accurate version of the contour, you know, given time constraints that we typically have? for planning these uh, cases. Does an extracted contour overwrite the original drawn contour? This could be an issue in some instances. Uh, so once if we actually extract a contour, is it going to actually delete what was originally there and overwrite it or will it keep the original contour? Some complex structures that give multiple independent contours need to be contoured on a single slice. Is the system then able to handle that? That's another thing that we have to check. And of course, creation use of reformatted images, right? So along the sagittal, coronal slices and any interpolated slices, we want to verify the accuracy of the geometric location of the image itself. The accuracy of the grayscale reconstruction, any, any, any interpolation performed during the reconstruction. And we want to be able to check the consistency between the new images and the original. And so this applies not just for the images, but for the contours as well. So for example, if we, if we acquired a CT set with the slice spacing of five millimeters, and then later on we decide that, well, no, this is too much of a, for us to get any information and fine detail. And then if we say, well, let's reconstruct that image to 2.5s, so in that instance, we're relying on the either the CT simulation software or the treatment planning system itself to resample that original CT image and provide us with that final resolution CT. Once we do that, though, we have to go back and verify that that final resolution CT, which was reformatted from a coarser one, actually matches a CT that was directly acquired on a two and a half millimeter slice thickness, for example. And so this is something that we need to check if we're going to be doing that, that type of uh, calculation. And also in terms of dose calculation itself, 
you know, depending upon resource constraints or physics support or whatever other reasons we may have patient throughput, one may decide that, well, I want to try and see what I can get away with, like how wide of a slice thickness can I get away with in terms of uh, treatment planning for some of these cases. So then in that case, as a test, at least, we want to acquire CT images at different slice thicknesses, do the dose calculations on each of those CT images and then compare to see, you know, what benefits does that finer resolution CT data have over the coarser ones. And then as an institution or a clinic decide which is the optimal thickness, slice thickness, or reform, reformatting process that we were going to stick to. And then of course, this is very important, is verifying the geometric location of slices with respect to the rest of the patient anatomy. So we want, again, we want to make sure that there are no image artifacts and that, that for all of the slices throughout the entire patient's anatomy, that relationship between the slices itself and the anatomy is maintained and that there are no reconstruction artifacts. Then once that's done, we do what's called an ROI or a region, region of interest analysis where we verify the mean, minimum, and maximum CT number in a slice and volume for a range of situations. Again, this is one way of quantifying the information that you're already seeing in the treatment planning system. Positional measurements are important. So within the coordinate space, you want to verify point coordinates, distances, angles, in each system for each display type. So your treatment planning system may offer different ways in which the space itself, the 3D space, is able to be displayed. So different rendering uh, possibilities. So we want to try and make sure that whatever display mechanism is being used, that it is based in some sort of ground truth and that it maintains that uh, relationship with a certain degree of consistency. And then of course, some treatment planning systems do offer a multiple window display use. So in that case, we want to verify that each panel of this multiple window display is kept current as the planning session proceeds, because you don't want to end up in a situation where you're trying to modify something in one view, and then it doesn't update in the other view, and then we lose track of what we were changing during the treatment planning. So these are all very, very qualitative tests as one, you know, there's a good mix between qualitative and quantitative tests here. But as a clinic or an institution, we have to decide, okay, which ones are we going to test, uh, you know, which ones take priority. And then once we have gone through all of this, of course, and we are happy with that the system is performing satisfactorily, we look at the hard copy printout and the idea here is because in a lot of instances, this is a printout that is going to serve as a treatment record for the patient's treatment, in addition to the electronic record, of course. So we want to make sure that that hard copy printout has the correct isodose lines, the correct plan information, the correct dwell times, and most importantly, the correct patient information. Because if that is not correct, then the rest of the things don't matter, right? Uh, so all of these things have to be checked. And then once the plan is ready, we want to verify that the treatment plan parameters are actually accurately transferred over to the treatment console. So we essentially, and that's another reason why we have the hard copy printout from the planning system, because we can then cross check those parameters in the hard copy printout to whatever is there on the treatment console before we start the treatment. And then depending upon what parameters should be checked, each institution can develop their own checklist, so to say, as a workflow process to ensure that all these parameters are in fact transferred over correctly. And then of course, we want to verify that, you know, the system is able to store the plan securely and and once we close down the computer for the day and then reboot it, that you're able to start the computer again and check the integrity of the treatment planning system. And 
So this is a pretty straightforward test, as you can see. So here in the next few slices, I'm just going to show you some uh, excerpts from our commissioning report here on the HDR system that we have. This is just for your reference currently in the presentation. I apologize for the quality of the slides here, but we will, you know, I'll, I'll go back and work on this a little bit more and then share it with the rest of you once I make sure that I have all you know, protected health information or patient information removed from some of these. So don't worry if you're not able to see things correctly, you will get a more clear version of this presentation once we're done. And then as far as uh, verifying these mathematical phantom structures, again, as I mentioned before, we do test specific structures of known sizes using both onto auto contouring tools and manual contouring tools. Check if the volume of the contours is correct. Once the contours are done, does the contour display actually look reasonable? And so these are just some examples. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, you will get more of these images in color with a lot more details, so don't worry about it. Uh, the idea just now is to highlight that we are using specific mathematical representations of physical structures and then providing a report for us. Saying, okay, you know, how does the volume compare to ground truth for different voxel sizes too? And that's important. So your dose grid is essentially determining how fine of a sampling that you want to do as far as your dose calculation accuracy goes. Uh, again, these are just some more examples. So this is all in the on-centra environment, you know, looking at the treatment planning system volume, you know, how does the voxel size influence that? And then we, we follow the AAPM guidelines as far as making sure that the TPS is consistent or performing consistently with the level of accuracy that we expect as outlined in some of these AAPM reports. A list of those reports is available at the last slice uh, in this presentation and any handouts that you know, we're going to be providing as part of this. If you have any questions about those also, we can always discuss either during this presentation or offline at any, any point. But these are again just some sample snapshots from our commissioning report uh, comparing the performance of this treatment planning system as far as how it's displaying contours, how it handles expansions, contractions, you know, and how it's actually handling the display of these contours at different slice locations and so on. So as a physicist or the person responsible for doing the commissioning at your institutions, you know, you would you would be expected to provide a report something you know, on the lines of this. Now that being said, Adam has in fact provided uh, me with an excellent worksheet that I'm sure will be shared with the rest of you. And in the next lecture, we're going to take some time to go over each of these and identify areas in that worksheet where you would then you know, enter information for each of these tests so that there is this common framework that we're all able to use. Uh, and that, that spreadsheet is actually a very excellent source or a starting point for all of us. So again, thank you, Adam, for sharing that with us. So let's take a, a quick uh, breather here. Are there any questions from that first section? Am I going too fast, too slow, or confusing you more? <laughs> Hi, Sastri, this is Ben. I thank you so much for your presentation so far. I think it's very well organized. And I think that Javier brought a, a good point. You know, he was wondering why do we check the house? All right, so while we wait for questions, let's move on. We'll be focusing on dose calculation tests. Now, now, in this part, this is not the actual dose calculation itself that we're going to focus on, but the results of those dose calculation and how we evaluate that. So it's more of a plan review based approach here. So essentially what we want to verify here is the correct functioning of the methods used to identify the regions of calculation. 
uh, we want to verify the grid size definition and whether we can use non-uniform grid spacing. Again, this is not something uh, most most of the time we'd like to use uniform grid spacing, but there are some centers that want to try this, you know, use this non-uniform grid spacing because in some instances that can be uh, a time saver as far as calculating dose, especially if there is really a need for computer resources. Most treatment planning systems that are available currently these days do come with hardware that is you know, very capable to handle fine grid spacing based dose calculations. But, you know, in some instances, we, there may be a need to use uh, non-uniform grid spacing. And if we are using that, you want to be able to test that as well. And again, if you're using interpolation methods for determining the dose between the grid points, how is that system performing? How is that algorithm performing? What happens when the grid size spacing or extent is changed? Uh, um, does the dose get recomputed automatically? Does the treatment planning system display a message saying, hey, this parameter has changed, so therefore this dose is no longer valid. Do you want us to recompute this dose again? Or does it do this automatically? And we need to understand that this is happening because, again, this could be uh, a safety issue, right? So if, when we, if whenever somebody knowingly or unknowingly changes the grid size, these planning system should be able to detect that and warn the user that something has changed with this. Is the dose coordinate system or computation system aligned correctly with the image-based coordinate system? So that's another thing we want to uh, try and verify that uh, you know, this alignment is correct. Does the TPS or the treatment planning system correctly read stored dose information? Does recalculation of dose distribution occur automatically when changes are made in anatomy definition, 12 times, or 12 positions? So again, these are the things that some treatment planning systems send out warnings to the user, some of them don't. So as a physicist or a technician or a therapist you know, or dosimetrist responsible for any of the plans that are being developed on these systems. It is on us to verify that all of these parameters are in fact correctly updated and the dose that is displayed or the dose distribution that is calculated and displayed represents the correct, you know, the accurate dose that we expect the patient to receive within some levels of uncertainty, of course. But these are again some things that we want to make sure that we are careful about. And then the actual dose points itself. So we talked about the 3D dose distributions. We are talking about dose points. Is the point defined at the desired 3D coordinate? Is the point displayed correctly at the correct 3D position? Is the dose at the point displayed correctly? And some, some of these planning systems have interactive point dose displays as well. So in those, in those instances, we want to make sure that we verify well, well whether do these point coordinates correctly correspond to cursor position on the display and does the dose at the point display correctly. And then of course there is consistency, especially when there are doses in intersect, intersecting planes and you know, that should be consistent. And we also should verify that the dose displayed with different display techniques should be consistent. So for example, if you're using, if you're looking at a dose in 3D, and if you're switching back the view between you know, axial orientation, sagittal, coronal, or like a like oblique plane, when we want to look at the dose, that it, it actually maintains the same integrity regardless of which display method that we are using. Right? Dose grids, of course, we want to verify that the dose is correctly interpolated between grid points for both small and large spacing. The effect of the grid size on the dose distribution. We talked about this before. So we want to create a single source distribution for varying grid sizes and then look at the effect of the uh, grid size on the dose distribution itself. And for each practice, we want to then come up with what is most optimal for us as far as you know what we're willing to accept in terms of time that it takes. So for example, if we were to use 0.1 millimeters, you know, it's going to take forever to calculate the dose. 
do we really need that kind of accuracy? And so as a, as a practice, it is upon us to determine what the ideal size for the dose grid is. 2D dose displays, the isodose lines should be correctly located. The color wash display should line up correctly with the isodose lines and agree with the point dose display. Isodose dose surfaces should also be displayed correctly and the surfaces should be consistent with the isodose lines on those planes. And then of course, once all of this is done, we have to look at the DVH is because that's really what the physicians are most interested in looking at next to you know, looking at the dose distribution on a slice by slice basis. So we want to test the creation of voxel ROI description used to create these DVHs against the structure description itself. What that means is once you create an ROI, you want to make sure that whatever information is displayed on the DVH for that ROI actually matches what is displayed on the screen when you evaluate it on a slice by slice basis itself. Test the DVH for overlapping structures. So in a lot of these instances, there are gonna be some overlapping structures and we wanna make sure that the DVH is actually displaying the correct information with the understanding that there is a certain degree of overlap. Now, this could be an issue, especially for the target and some organs at risk. How are voxels belonging to multiple structures handled? So this is again a very important thing to remember because the same voxel in some instances, especially at the boundaries, could be a portion of the uh, target. It could be a portion of the normal tissue as well, especially when we're talking about expansion structures around the target. So how is this handled by the planning system? That is something and, and whether this information is correctly transferred over to the DVH itself. And we also have to verify the accuracy of the dose interpolated into each voxel as well. Now, one has to remember that we're talking about brachytherapy here, right? So this is not like external beam. There is going to be a certain degree of uncertainty that we are all used to. And this, uh, this level of uncertainty is going to be a little bit more greater when compared to external beam based dose calculations. Um, we also test the accuracy of volume determination with irregularly shaped objects, such as rectangular structures with sharp corners, things like that. We also verify that the appropriate histogram bins and limits are used, right? And test the DVH calculation algorithm with known dose distributions. So example, as an example, just simple tandem and ovoids. You know, and then compare it with a secondary treatment planning system if it's available or if another center that you're collaborating with has a different treatment planning system then we can share data between those centers for the same test case and then determine what the differences are and that could be a way of cross-checking both treatment planning systems verify all types of histograms both the differential and the cumulative histograms that all, you know, both of these are actually calculated and displayed correctly. And also test the DVH plotting and output with known dose distribution. So essentially print out the DVHs for a simple tandem and ovoid case and look at it and verify the relationship of the plan dose values to the DVH results. So essentially create a plan with a known treatment dose and look at the DVHs. And then review and understand the relationship of dose and DVH grids. So um, it, there is a difference between you know the, the, the grid size or the the bin size for a DVH versus the actual dose calculation grid. So we want to be able to make sure that the information that is displayed on the DVH represents an optimal trade-off between how fine of a grid we use for dose calculation versus how fine of a bin that you want to organize these doses into for it to be displayed on a DVH. So as, as the person responsible for reviewing a plan, we are expected to look at the effects of all of these and understand what the DVH is actually showing us. And then these are again some snapshots uh, from our commissioning report for the various tests that we just talked about before. And these include all of these dose calculation based tests or testing the results that you see both on an isodose plane here and you know, a DVH also. 
and I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I will improve the quality of these things a little bit and maybe even get some color images that I can share with you in a handout. And if there's any questions, so, so again, this, this report is very specific to our institution. So you can use this as a guide if you want to start, but I would still stick to the spreadsheet that Adam Schulman has you know, made and then compare these results to what is shown already there. Because that's a little bit more of a generalized version and then use that as a starting point for HDR commissioning. Uh, again, these are just some test plans uh, that we did, looking at dose displays for each of these points here and then comparing them uh, between two different treatment planning systems, things like that. And then looking at comparisons of the DVH values itself, both for a target and for a normal tissue structure and understanding the difference between the DVH pin size versus the dose calculation grid itself. And in some instances, there may be some features or rather bugs in each treatment planning system. Now these may be specific to the manufacturer as we were able to see in this instances, in this particular instance where we saw some you know, somewhat significant differences between the planning system and another planning system especially when we were looking at DVH values that were on display. Now, the manufacturer got back to us saying, hey, well, it is because of the way we handle DVHs. That's why you see this difference between our system and another system. And so as long as we're able to understand and quantify that, then that is a totally acceptable. And so some, in some instances, yes, the manufacturer does need to be involved in some of the commissioning as far as answering questions about specific instances of any differences that the user may find. And again, more of DVH-based testing and reports based on that. So the, again, like I mentioned before, this is a sheet, uh, a slide that has all the references listed that I used as a source for this particular presentation. Of course, uh, needless to say, I also did uh, get a lot from Adam's uh, worksheet as well. We will be devote, devoting some time tomorrow when we actually go through that worksheet, try and understand where each of these parameters you know, will need to be entered. So we'll do that tomorrow when we discuss these other two sections on dosimetric testing, All right? So that's, that's my presentation for today. If there are any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them. Hi, Sastri. Can you hear us? So it seems that perhaps Sastri's audio is not working, but I'm going to try to type what I'm saying here. I want to encourage everyone here to feel free to ask any questions. I know that Javier had a, a good question about why do we use Hounsfield units? And I was wondering, do have other centers also experienced sort of similar uncertainties as uh, how beer has? All right, so we have one question saying uh, the commissioning results look very comprehensive and how much time is involved. So I think when we started this process, it uh, took us a good two weeks. This is what I gleaned from uh, my colleagues because I was not in the Bracky service when the HDR commissioning happened here. So I can very easily say that it, it took us a good two weeks of consistent work at this to be able to come up with this commissioning setup. Hope that answers the question. I 
another question is what parts of this do you repeat for software version upgrades now that's a very very good question it really depends on what that software upgrade is offering so you know depending upon the manufacturer some of them might offer an upgrade that addresses specific bugs or fixes so this could be like a small incremental upgrade or it could be like a bigger upgrade so for and it, it really depends on what is mentioned in the release notes for that particular upgrade so if that particular upgrade is just offering some cosmetic changes in the way things are displayed or like some interface changes or addressing specific bugs then those are the ones that you test because you don't want to be spending a whole you know set of a whole effort trying to verify everything. So the main thing is to look at the release notes from the manufacturer. One thing that will help is to have a stable of test cases that are available at your disposal that you can just quickly you know, commission for any of these upgrades. And then we can discuss this in more detail offline if needed. And again, if, if that particular system is actually upgrading the underlying dose calculation mechanism itself or the algorithm itself, then that essentially means we have to go back and recompute all of the plans that we did and reestablish the model. So that takes a long time. So it really depends on what is offered as part of that software upgrade. Hopefully that answers that. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, then thank you so much for being here today. And then I'll see you again for the second part. All right. Bye-bye. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's another question. So which part of the TPS commissioning you found the most inconsistencies? At least from our experience with OnCentra, I mean, again, I was not directly involved with the commissioning here, so I cannot, with any <laughs> degree of confidence, comment on that. But if I were to take a guess, I would say, okay, what to really focus on if time is limited? The main thing is the dose calculation itself. So you really want to focus on whether the, the, the underlying dose calculation algorithm is calculating the dose as you know you want it uh, to be calculated and that there is good agreement between the dose that is calculated by the planning system and you know when you compare it with uh, hand calcs or even with an independent calculation system for example and you want to test this for a specific set of consistent geometries like say a tandem and ovoid simple cases so that you understand that the system is at least doing what it's supposed to do and then the rest of this stuff you, you, you can as time permits develop the program slowly and commission it piecemeal so to say specific to what type of cases that you want to commission this for but mainly it's the dose calculation part and the the, the geometrical verification at least for a few set of known geometries to make sure that you know the system is doing what it's supposed to as far as handling heterogeneities again that's not super critical especially in a bracket therapy environment but if that's something that you really want to focus on uh, if you have the time then that would be an optional thing to do
All right, thank you all. Thanks a lot. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. See everyone.